um, we should get going, right? Okay, so, great. Uh, and we're live. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, or good evening if you're in the UK. We're here to talk to Sarah Penner about her new novel, The London Seance Society. And we're also, I'm pleased to say, going to be introducing you to Susan Stokes Chapman. And the only copy we currently have of Pandora, because I keep hand selling it to everybody, Ian is holding it up. And it is a paperback original here in the United States. Susan lives in the UK. Um, and I'm delighted that when I was reading Susan's book in the acknowledgement, she spoke about Sarah and how much how much help Sarah had been. So I thought I'll ask Sarah if she would be all right if Susan joins us. And Sarah was delighted. So here we all are. Right. Thank you, Ian, very much. So ladies, um, I thought hoping that you'll mostly talk to each other, but Sarah sent some, I thought, excellent questions that um that I'm interested in, and then I'll sort of fade away here and let you talk. But why is it that you both are so interested in writing British historical fiction? And you're not quite in the same time, but sort of close. Was The Lost Apothecary Georgian? I can't remember, Sarah. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, The Lost Apothecary's historical narrative takes place in 1791, which is Georgian London. And that's actually, I believe, how Susan and I first uh, became connected was on Twitter. She had posted something to the effect of, does anybody else find themselves enamored of George and London? And I think I said yes. And then we started following each other. And it's been really interesting because um, we've, we kind of became critique partners and uh, we, when we first started interacting, neither of us were agented and then we both got agents and then we both got book deals. And, uh, it's so funny that, that just that simple tweet, uh, connected us. And then when I was in London last year for the paperback release of the lost apothecary, she was able to attend a garden party hosted by my publisher. So we were able to meet in person and it's just really interesting how the virtual world can bring people together and apparently George in London too. Yeah. I mean, we first connected, I mean, I think you said it must've been gosh, six, seven years ago. So that's mm -hmm. how long the connection has been around. And obviously Sarah and I, as she's just said, you know, we were both writing fiction in the Georgian era, but actually we were both writing novels, which we have since had to shelve. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we've kind of just been on this journey together. Sarah a little bit first, you know, a bit, bit before me, but I'm following closely behind. And, and yeah, we've, we've had pretty similar stories, I think, haven't we? Yeah. And we've, we've both read each other's unpublished manuscript. Um, yeah. and, and that's kind of the that's what critique partners find themselves doing is you get to see the good, the bad and the ugly. So we do, we both have a shelved manuscript that was never agented, never published. And um, then of course we've both read each other's debuts. So it's, it's funny how it all has worked out. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I mean, I love George in London, which has a very long sweep. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was just looking up David Liss's first book to see it is a conspiracy of paper was the rare historical that won an Edgar Award when um, when it came out. And it's basically about the South Sea bubble. So it is at the earlier part of the 18th century. You both are writing in the later part of the 18th century. So much historical is either Victorian or Regency. And people get Regency all wrong because they think mm -hmm. it's actually late Georgian, mm -hmm. you know, all the way. So why Georgian in particular? What is there about the late 18th century that really fires at you up? Well, who for the lost apart. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Susan. I was, I was just going to say, who who wants to take this first? Sarah, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take it first. Um, I had a very uh, specific time frame I needed to fall. Uh, in front of because my book, The Lost Apothecary, is about disguised poison and women using poison against the men who have wronged them. And in the 1850s is when we began to saw the ad 
see the advent of forensic toxicology and the ability to detect poison during an autopsy. So I absolutely had to stay in front of that time frame. Right. So um, I knew I needed to be either in the first half of the 1800s, but I thought that there was something so kind of um, enchanting about going back a little bit further. And George in London is so, like you said, Barbara, it's not, we don't see that era a lot in commercial fiction, at least in the US um, and I think the UK as well. And it, so it kind of feels untapped and yet it was such an interesting era in terms of um, everything from police corruption. I mean, it was pre-industrial revolution, there was the gin craze. Um, we had sort of a, a crazy king uh, sitting on the throne, King George III. So I, I always just felt like it was so interesting and brothels everywhere and just a, a time in London's history that we haven't seen a lot of fiction take place. And then, of course, like I said, it worked really well for an apothecary who needs to get away with her sinister behavior. So that's why I, cho- I chose George in London, but definitely want to hear Susan's thoughts as well. Well, mine comes from very young age, really. So the initial obsession started when I was about nine or 10 and I saw the the BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice in 1995. And obviously back then I was a kid, I didn't get any of the more troublesome themes that were kind of going along underneath all I saw at that point was the romance and the beauty of it and oh how romantic and how lovely and fans and bulls and all that kind of thing but it is the thing that actually got me research in the era so it must have been around 14 or 15 that I was really heavily kind of reading historical fiction um whether it was a corset ripper or something a little bit more um bit more staid and a bit more realistic but I just became completely immersed in the era I'm also born and bred in Litchfield in Staffordshire and that's the uh, home city of Dr Johnson who wrote the first English dictionary so I've always had a kind of subconscious link I think to the era anyway but I studied a lot of romanticism modules at university so that's covering the poets Keats and Byron and Shelley my first shelved novel was inspired by one of these modules um and i won't go into massive details here but it was essentially a it was a it was the female voice of a real life um love affair essentially by the journalist william hazlitt and the reason i suppose i chose george in london for my novel is partly because I didn't want to waste so much of the research that I'd already done on this first novel because I spent an unhealthy amount of time spent, you know, on this novel. Um, It must have been not writing it for 10 years, but from the kind of original idea to the research, the writing to the final rejection, that was a 10 year sort of gap. Mm. And I didn't want to waste any of that research. There was such a lot there. And I thought I need to use it somehow. But my own novel it is a loose reinterpretation of the greek myth pandora's box set in the antiquity scene and one of the big questions i'm often asked is how you know why why greek myth and why why put it into georgian london it's just it seems such an odd sort of thing to do but my answer is actually well no because the georgians were fascinated by the ancient world they spent a lot of time uh abroad themselves so many of the aristocrats would go on the grand tour and they would bring a lot of that inspiration of the old world back and it would go into their architecture and it would go into their jewelry designs I could do a whole essay on this and I'm not going to but I think the key point I want to make here is that the antiquity scene was a big thing for them so the excavation of Pompeii was a was in the late um you know 1700s so that was still quite fresh And many uh, pieces of antiquity, such as vases, for instance, were brought over to the UK. And one avid collector who is actually a main character in my novel uh, was William Hamilton. And he had a vast collection of Greek antiquity, vases, Greek vases in particular. And I just found that interesting in the way that I could potentially, potentially use the 
idea of Pandora's box and the fact historically it was never a box to begin with, but it was actually a vase. Um, I thought like I can link these two. And there was a shipwreck and that was an historic fact. And I thought I can use this. And, and so 1799, I had to use that particular year because that was the year the HMS Colossus sank, which happened to have on board a lot of William Hamilton's collection. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, in, in that sense, A, I didn't want to waste the research I'd done for book one and B, the year as Sarah said, it, it matched the what, what I was trying to do with the story. So I came to your book, I have to admit, because I have a lifelong fascination with Wedgwood, Josiah yeah. Wedgwood, who actually began his pottery in the middle of the 18th century and laid the groundwork for a lot of the British Industrial Revolution by digging mm -hmm. canals because pottery or sponsoring canals because pottery was fragile and it yeah. floated down to market a lot better than it traveled. And I have a book over here called The Radical Potter, which um, I keep trying to find moments in between Zoom events when I could actually read it. So it, it, you're based because Wedgwood actually recreated a number of, you know, um, antique really got me going. But the other thing I loved about your book is, um, and I don't know if either of you are familiar with the late Elizabeth Peters, who was actually Barbara Michaels, who was actually uh, Barbara Mertz, and she was a, an Egyptian, actually a PhD Egyptologist, and wrote wow. an amazing series about Amelia Peabody, who was a 19th century Victorian lady there, I don't want to say they're mystery, they're rom-com, they're all sorts of things. One of the best-selling series you can imagine. And there were many things in Pandora that reminded me of Elizabeth Peters' work, which I recommend oh. to you, starting with the crocodile and the sandbags. So we have a huge customer base for Elizabeth Peters. So I have been telling people that Pandora is the book you want to read. Oh, well, um, thank you, you very much. Peter, well, there's lots of similar things, but we should really, this is mm. after all, Sarah's. It is. He <laughs> read here. Sarah, so, the show. <laughs> so since Susan, you haven't thoroughly read um, the London Sayout Society, Sarah, why don't we talk about that for a minute and then you and yep. Susan can chat. Um, I loved The Lost Apothecary. We had a great conversation, if I remember right. I'll, unfortunately, also mm -hmm. on Zoom, but I'm still yeah. hoping to get Sarah to Scottsdale one of these days. Um, what interested you in jumping a century almost, 1873? Was it the whole Victorian thing about spiritualism, that uh, which was true in, not just in England, but in uh, all over? And why do you think it was such a thing in the 19th century? Right. It's it's funny because when we started this call, Barbara, you said that most uh, or a lot of historical fiction, particularly set in London, takes place in, um, in not in the Georgian era, but in the Victorian or Regency eras. And I remember when I wrote and published The Lost Apothecary, kind of using that as, uh, you know, something to kind of not brag about, but I would share that I, I avoided the Victorian era. And this is this is set in Georgian London. And then, of course, my second book, uh, I wanted to write a ghost story. I've always wanted to write a ghost story. I knew I wanted it to take place in London. And you cannot take those two elements together, a ghost story in London, and avoid the Victorian era because the Victorians were enamored of the spirit world and the paranormal and their the, the wealthy were having parlor room seances every week for their rich friends. And so I knew if I'm going to tell a story in which seances uh, take a central role, this needs to be set in the Victorian era. So I, I chose 1873. And the book is about a woman named Vaudeline. And she's known internationally for her skill in the art of seance, particularly her ability to conjure the spirits of murder victims to ascertain the identity of the people who killed them. And she gets a knock on her door from a young woman named Lina, who's the story's protagonist. And Lina is from London, and she has lost her sister under suspicious circumstances. And the police are really given, giving the, the murder case no attention whatsoever, and Lena is like me. She's a skeptic. She doesn't necessarily believe in the spirit world. Uh, and she wants to figure out what happened to her little sister. So she chooses to set that skepticism aside. 
and seek out Vaudeline's help in hopefully conjuring her sister's spirit to solve this murder case. So it's been described as a gothic whodunit, which I think is very appropriate. And I really enjoyed digging into some of the lesser known customs and rituals that the Victorians held around death and dying. I mean, we all know about our traditions that still exist today to wear dark colors to funerals. Mm. But if you if you look back at the Victorians, they actually had very rigid, strict practices, even going so far as the width of the silk band around a man's top hat. If he was attending the funeral services of someone that was a distant cousin, that width may be just a couple of centimeters. But if it was a spouse or a child, that band could be up to seven inches high. So their their rules were much more strict and rigid than what we see today. Another kind of morbid example is this tradition that we still have of sending flowers to a funeral home. Uh, that originated because there we didn't have the technology and the science to embalm bodies. And so the Victorians would surround the casket with flowers in order to mask the odor of the body. So the book is full of really interesting uh, tidbits that I learned. Um, households in mourning, they would stop their clocks at the time that the deceased died. Any photos of the deceased person, they would turn face down. There's all sorts of of things, and in the back of the book, one of the one of the pieces of the book that a lot of early readers have have enjoyed is kind of a not a comprehensive but a fairly substantial list of Victorian mourning traditions in right. the back of the book. So, uh, but I I'm so glad that that's the era that I chose for this book. I think it was the right approach. I think that Victorian fiction is popular for a reason. And uh, I really tried to sort of take a fresh approach to it. And um, I, I can't imagine having said it in any other era. No, I don't think you could. I mean, morning jewelry, you know, and hair and all the rest. They had, there were a lot of weird things. The Costume Institute at the Met did a really great show on Victorian morning sometime mm-hmm. before the pandemic. I don't remember exactly where they even talked about how you graduate from deep black to gray and then lighter gray. Mm-hmm. And then you could wear violet <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it was a huge deal. This may seem far out to you, but I've often thought about this. And Susan, it, you know, the the drug of choice really in the Elizabethan, certainly into the 18th century was alcohol, especially the 18th century where they were swigging mm-hmm. gin, you know, blue mm-hmm. rune from Holland and so forth. But in the 19th century, and probably partly because of India and Afghanistan, um, there was a lot of opium use. And, you know, which one is it? The, the opium eater? I can't remember. Was it Macaulay? No. Anyway. Sure. And so I sort but, of wondered. Sorry? I was just thinking that the name was on the tip of my tongue and it's just completely gone out of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, Thomas, Thomas somebody. It'll come to me. There's that wonderful yeah. trilogy by David Morrell about about the guy who was the opium eater and in between in yeah. several moments he solved mm-hmm. crimes. But anyway, my my point was that I'm wondering because, you know, if you're drunk, you're just drunk. But if you're on drugs, there's an altered state thing going on. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if some of this interest, you know, in seance and the supernatural and all the rest of it was partly because, you know, people had begun to experience drugs. That's an interesting theory. I mean, if you if you kind of reverse back a few years and you look at where did this idea of spiritualism really originated, it actually originated on the East Coast of the United States with these young women, um, commonly just known as the Fox sisters. Uh, but they they believed that there was basically something haunting their family home and quickly realized they could make pretty good money off of uh either having people over or um, somehow communicating with spirits in other venues. And then that, that became an attraction and sort of a form of entertainment that hopped across the Atlantic and ultimately landed in Europe. But that Mm -hmm. is interesting. I mean, I think you can't deny that there is some sort of connection between the entertainment element of seances and public displays of mediumship and the various substances and and liquors and what have you that people would uh, be enjoying while attending such events that probably made the experience more interesting and possibly more believable. 
Oh, it's right. a, it, it is definitely interesting because you have this um, tonal shift throughout each each century. So in the Georgian era, for instance, um, witchcraft was not considered necessarily a sin in the way that it was in the in the 17th century. The witch trials had really come to a close um, quite I'd, I'd say kind of early 1700s and we have the rise of the of the enlightenment coming along and the idea of science and how actually magic is is just another name for for, for something else for, for a different belief system um certainly near the end of the 18th century there was a complete fascination for the occult and it wasn't necessarily frowned down upon in the way that it was a century before that. But the, in the Victorian era, it suddenly became extremely popular and a bit of fun. Again, it's not frowned down, you know, frowned upon then either. It's something, you know, that, that is essentially an entertainment um, for many. Um, Sarah, obviously you've done the research and you'll know a bit more than that. But I do know in the Georgian era, it wasn't, there wasn't any particular fear I think, behind the occult in the way that they have been in centuries before it. They just didn't, they just more kind of focused on science. And obviously you have the Industrial Revolution and everything kind of slowly turning to a more logical mindset. I mean, you have um, in in the country and in Wales, where I am, for, for instance, you have the, the old herbal remedies and you have the old superstitions, but there were nothing to be necessarily afraid of. Mm -hmm. They were more revered and generally respected and just something to be aware of rather than anything else. And then, like I said, you have that tonal shift into the Victorian era when it's a massive thing that was marketable almost. Um, I will say in terms of your question, Barbara, the in terms of so the, the Georgians, they tended to uh, rely a lot on laudanum, uh, which had the trace of the poppy seed in it. And then there was that shift from laudanum to opium specifically. Um, but I think there is definitely an argument there to be said that, you know, the poppy seed as a drug definitely caused some sort of mental kind of breakdown. Well, it's an in, altered in state, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it isn't just pain treatment or oblivion. Mm. It's an altered state. I looked it up as Thomas de Quincey is who I was trying to remember. De Quincey, that's it, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> So, Sarah, since you've read Sarah's book, why don't I just be quiet? And, I mean, Sarah, you read Susan's book. Why don't yep. I be quiet? And you talk to her about Pandora. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I thought would maybe be useful for this discussion is um, obviously when we talk about fiction and we have our story, but there's always something bigger than the story and, and kind of these themes that are overlaid on top of the plot and the characters. And so I'm curious, Susan, what, what you would consider a couple of the main themes running through Pandora and why you decided to write a story about those themes? Sure. Well, I think we have to address the fact that this was, even though it's a loose retelling, it is still essentially a reinterpretation, a retelling of the Greek myth Pandora's box. And obviously Greek myth is a massive craze at the moment. Um, we're all going crazy for it. And I think whether we're a classicist or not, I think we can all agree that in Greek myth, they're very misogynistic tales. Women are either written as the victim or the villain. Pandora, the mythical Pandora herself, her curiosity by opening the box uh, is, is considered a sin. Mm. And I thought that quite unfair. And why should curiosity be interpreted in, in such a way? So we all know the general principle, Zeus gives the first woman, Pandora, a box, told never to open it, she opens it, all the sins of the world come out, she slams it shut and hope remains. So for my novel, I wanted to kind of readdress the balance on that. And I wanted to give my Dora, who is a loose you know, iteration of the mythical Pandora, that agency, I wanted to make her a strong woman. I wanted to make her the hero of her own story to celebrate her curiosity because in every single point 
of the novel, it is Dora who is calling the shots. And she is the one that is essentially the catalyst towards everything. Now, obviously, we have good male characters as well as, you know, and there are some bad male characters. And there's even a couple of questionable female characters. They are all very selfish in their own way, Dora included, actually. But the novel does touch on all of essentially the deadly sins that the the Pandora's box, you know, kind of opened up onto the world. But there's also that uh, underlying element of hope, I hope, that uh, connects everything all together. But I think my main idea was for this to be a novel that celebrated the strength and the virtues of women in, in many ways, and that that could be a triumphant thing. And as I said, Dora would be the hero, the heroine of her of her own story, essentially. That was something I was very keen to kind of get across. I absolutely love that, um, particularly because I feel like historical fiction is finally over the last five, 10 years, we've seen so much historical fiction that's placing women front and center. And some of that is biographical in nature and telling the stories of real women who lived and kind of fictionalizing the narrative around them where, where we don't have information about what their life might've been like, but that's been something that's been really refreshing. And I'm sure you've seen that too, Susan, and your various peers in the UK who are writing historical fiction that a lot of stories nowadays seem to really put women and their decisions and their agency front and center. Yeah. I love for your novel, how you do have these two strong female characters as, as very much you did with The Lost Apothecary. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us just a little bit more about how you develop this strong female bond that you have between them and, and essentially why you wanted to re- revisit the female bond? And also, how is it potentially different from the bond that you explored with your two leads in The Lost Apothecary? Mm-hmm. So there, it's funny, there are a couple of similarities in the relationships between women um, in my two books. And then there are obviously some differences. Something that happened almost without my even noticing it is this, uh, this relationship that is a teacher and a student or another, you may say teacher and apprentice. Um, So in the lost apothecary, of course, that's Nella, the apothecary. And then she has young Eliza, who is an apprentice of sorts. And then in the London Seance Society, we see Lena trying to learn the art of seance from this world-renowned spiritualist. And I, I didn't really realize until uh, till I was fairly underway with my second book that I had gone down this same path of having a young woman sort of looking up to a more experienced woman Um, And I've I've tried to do some introspective soul searching and ask myself (laughs) if there's something inside of me that is triggering this. Um, Mm. And I I really can't come up with anything except that I love the idea of, in both of my stories, women banding together and helping one another. And sometimes help comes in the form of teaching and instruction. And I think that... And, and you probably resonate with this too, Susan, at a certain point in a new writer's career, you have to kind of sit down and say, what is, what do I envision my brand as? And what do my readers want from me next? And what's kind awesome. of going to be my ongoing brand? Mm. And I knew pretty early on, I want to feature strong women who are banding together and yeah. sometimes acting in rebellious, subversive ways. And so I think that uh, in both of my stories, we find women kind of in precarious situations and having to use their ingenuity to work themselves out. Um, but it's it's been fun. And I there are so many opportunities for story ideas around that and women who, who are helping one another. So, and I mean, I'm working on my third book now, and I definitely want to ask you more about what's next for you. Um, but I I don't have in this third book I'm working on, I don't really have a teacher student relationship again, Um, but there are certainly plenty of elements of women banding together and supporting one another. Just a kind of a side kind of comment there. I love your character names for for, for this one. They were, they're inspired, they're just really 
striking I think or you know visually in the way that they sound as well they just kind of flow off the off the tongue I think they're brilliant where did they come from was that were they inspired by any real life ones or was it just a kind of little genius spark that happened in your head um so Vaudeline was a name that I came across during some of my research into well-known spiritualists who lived during uh, the 1870s. Um, mm. And I thought that was just such an elegant French uh, French name. So she was, she was easy. Um, and she's got a French last name as well, uh, Dialaire. Right. So I think that that's how she came about. Lina, um, that the origin of the name Lina means lion, lion's heart. And oh, wow. I never actually put that in the book. I think maybe it was in an early draft and then I nixed it, but I know <laughs> what it means. Um, but there, I always just viewed her as kind of lion hearted. She can be a little temperamental, um, certainly rebellious. And uh, I, I really liked that name as well. And it's funny because my apothecary in the lost apothec in the lost apothecary, her name is Nella. And someone on my team asked me, Nella, Lena, like, did you know you use the same letters? Was that purpose? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I said, no, I, it just was total coincidence that it happened. So what about you? How did you come up with your character names? Well, Dora Blake was obviously going to be, you know, Pandora, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't want there to be a kind of blatant, there was too many words, you know, the kind of um, times I use the word Pandora. So my my version of Pandora still had to kind of be individual in her own right. Blake um, was inspired by William Blake, who was a famous uh, poet in the, in the Georgian era. So that had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, Edward Lawrence just simply popped up. I just think it felt like a very natural name to do. But my, my favourite character and my favourite name is actually Cornelius, Cornelius mm -hmm. Ashmole. Um, Cornelius... Again, I, I'm not too sure where Cornelius came from, but Ashmole, that was a little kind of my own Easter egg because uh, in Litchfield, where, as I said, where I grew up, there was a man named, named Elias Ashmole and he was born and, and lived in Litchfield for a very long time. But he was actually the founder of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, where many, um, you know, kind of antiques are, are kept. He was also a member of the Society of Antiquaries, which is what I talk about quite a bit in the novel as well. So I tended to kind of look at names that actually existed in the era, like you, Sarah, and kind of just pull inspiration from those and kind of just do a bit of a kind of, um, you know, kind of little kind of patchwork quilt element there. But I love kind of looking through old names and looking at um, old texts as well. And you can, I mean, some of the names are so unusual. Yeah. There was one um, that Emily Brand, who's a, an, an historical um, Georgian historian, um, she does a lot of archive research and some of the names that she's picked out are absolutely hilarious. And I'm definitely going to take one of those at some point. And how about the magpie? Remind me uh, the, the bird's name and how did the bird become a character in your story? Well, the idea for Dora and Hermes themselves, they did they did genuinely just pop into my head fully formed. I will say that Hermes was not named Hermes to begin with. He was actually named Marius. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use that name at some point, I think, probably book three. Um, but my editor very rightly questioned when we we're kind of near the end of the structural edits. You've got all these kind of Greek references. Why on earth have you chosen the word Marius? When Dora herself is half Greek, why? And I was like, yeah, you're right. I don't know why I did that. Um, I just like the name. So I had to then think about what name would actually suit this magpie. And we mm. and I kind of looked up all the Greek names of the gods and the goddesses. And I thought, there we go, Hermes, because Hermes was the god of mischief and the god of thieves. And he was also a messenger for the gods. So it kind of that just suited the novel because without giving too much away Hermes does have a key role and if you consider what that role is and what those names represent it it, it made sense yeah and I, I think the early draft that I read his name was still Marius yes. uh, and Hermes happened later but I love that that's such a fitting name given mm. uh, all the things that unfold during the story yeah <laughs> 
So tell me this, because, you know, Dora, among her other virtues, um, is trying to be a professional woman. Why did you decide to make her a jewelry designer, which I thought was wonderful? Oh, I think that was probably a subconscious decision, to be perfectly honest. I've always loved my antique jewelry. I'm wearing a few now. Um, and again, that was just part of the character element that came fully formed in, in my mind. Uh, I've always loved antique jewelry myself. And I thought that would be quite fun. I wanted her to be creative. I wanted to have some sort of hobby that was also realistic in the sense to the situation that she was in herself because she's she doesn't have a lot of money. Well, she has no money, let's be honest. She, she has no money. She's living um, essentially in poverty in the antiquity shop that used to belong to her parents. And she is trying to find a way to escape. And I thought there's only one way that she could potentially do that and that is to draw and to kind of have this dream um, that would take her beyond the confines of the situation she has found herself. And it, it, to me, it was, it was just something I thought I could make that work. Yeah, well, it seemed to me that women were allowed to be creative in, in a different way than they were not really allowed to go into trade, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole shopkeeper thing. But, you know, if she were a creative person designing jewelry or there were women who did silversmithing I think and yeah. other stuff right. and then that was okay you know there was a sort of cachet about being creative yeah. that was different than if you were um you know earning money in a I mean the typewriter had a lot to do with allowing women to become you know professional in a different way but you're a century away from that <laughs> right Remember in yeah. Dorothy Sayers, you know, there's a whole pool of ladies who, you know, who use their typewriter, they're in secretarial school. Um, yeah. So that became a thing and you're before that. I don't think we've mentioned how much fun Pandora is because Elizabeth Peters, for those of you who've read her, she really wrote what one could describe as romps in a way. They were, they were just lots of fun. You know, there would be a quest, there would be a treasure, there would be romance, there would be. So Pandora is really a lot of fun. Um, it is. I mean, I, I did have a lot of fun writing it. And I would, while it is definitely gothic fiction, I think it's more on the lighter side of gothic fiction. Um, whereas what I'm currently writing at the moment is a lot darker. Um, so mm -hmm. like you, Sarah, I decided that I wanted to kind of do something. When I say it is slightly different, but again, like yours, Sarah, that there are echoing elements there. I, I think there's almost like this, this typeset I think potentially both of us have gone down with with the second novels mm -hmm. and the third like your third moves away from that somewhat so it, it is interesting but I, I knew for my debut I wanted to have it some you know something that would still show well I'm always going to write in the Georgian era that that is that is a given I, I don't see myself changing but the Georgian era is such a vast period of history it's 1714 through to the 1830s I've got plenty to play with so I'm not too worried about that so but you can typecast me I suppose as a Georgian writer but some of them probably going to be darker than others and I didn't think as a debut it was best to start off with a quite a dark novel I think there needed to be lightness and some fun what else can you tell us about this second novel that you're working on? Right. Well, um, we're hoping to, to announce the title uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, what I can say is that it is set in 1780s Wales. So it's the area that I'm living now. It's a, a rural place. So we're completely straying from Georgian mm -hmm. London. We're now in rural Georgian Snowdonia. So a very, very different kind of setting. But there'll be a male character and a female character. So again, we have that kind of echo of the, of the two different sexes in the lead. Um, and as a very, very brief premise, it's about a doctor who has been fired from his previous job for reasons currently unknown and sent to the backwaters Wales to take over a position that's become vacant. And what he finds there essentially is uh, a place full of myth and superstition and some funny kind of odd goings on that don't quite add up. So well, what could sounds be fascinating. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the Mabinogian, all that wonderful legend. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. also, I am going to try and lean in as much to the Welsh myth as possible, right. but I'm also exploring elements of the occult and the Hellfire clubs uh, that were prevalent mm -hmm. in the era as well. So mm -hmm. it's a, a bit of a mix. I and are you, are you still editing, Susan? I am, yes. Okay. So we're... I had I had trouble with this one. Um, my this is my tricky second novel, and I'm very envious that you've managed to whack yours out so so fast. But um, mine has been a bit of a devil. But we are finally we can finally see the wood for the trees now. So fingers Good. crossed, it kind of continues that way. That's great. There will come a day where you are done with it, and you I hope will be celebrating. Thank heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and what Sarah? about you? Oh, sorry, Bob. Oh, I was just going to say, what, what about Sarah's book? Same question you were Same asking. Same question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm working on my third book. Uh, it's due to my editor at the end of the year. So I've got about, I guess, eight months. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm working, I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through the first draft. And it is not set in London. So I, I knew that if I wrote a third book set in the really mysterious atmospheric old alleyways of London, I, I was worried I, I might be pigeonholing myself and that that mm. would be what readers come to expect from me forever. So I decided to write something set elsewhere. And this book takes place on the Amalfi coast in Italy. Mm. And it is dual timeline, uh, similar to the lost apothecary. So we've got a present day narrator she is a marine archaeologist and a very advanced scuba diver, and she is on a project off of the Am Amalfi coastline, and she investigates this, this area uh, that's uh, riddled with mysterious shipwrecks. And the historical timeline um, is takes place in 1814, and it's when Positano in Italy was just a very quaint, almost unheard of fishing village. And there is a coven of witches who live in the village and they have power over the sea. And um, there is essentially, they leave behind a legend uh, about what may have been causing some of these shipwrecks. So we see how these two stories ultimately um, intertwine. So I'm really excited about the book. My husband and I are scuba divers. We've gone diving in many a shipwreck in the Florida Keys. So I'm having a lot of fun with writing some of the underwater scenes. I think it's going to be my longest book yet. It's yeah. certainly my most ambitious in terms of research. And uh, of course, we also have the added complication uh, that I don't know Italian. So I am, uh, and of course my characters are mostly Italian. So I'm reading right now uh, the book Loyalty by Lisa Scottolini that just came out a, a couple of weeks ago and, and her whole story takes place in Sicily. And I'm reassured that she's, uh, by what she's doing because of course most of the book is written in English and then she just occasionally yeah. like a little dash of salt and pepper will throw in an Italian word within context so the reader can understand what it means. Yeah. So I'm I'm very excited about this next book, uh, and I'm particularly excited to have the first draft done because I've been on tour for a bit now, and I haven't been able to work on it for a few weeks. So I look forward to getting through the first draft. I'll it's definitely link to um, Lisa's book launch, which we did with Hank Philippi Ryan, when she yeah. talks about some things that I think might be of interest to you okay so you both you both talked about the word or both mentioned the word gothic which i said a couple of years ago was going to be the next big thing and sure enough it is what do you mean by gothic susan Ooh. what do you what do you think gothic means i mean it's it's such <laughs> a big word but all of a sudden it's cropping up in ways that i am not mm. really sure um are are appropriate it's becoming a buzzword well the thing is, I, I wouldn't personally say it's popping up. I think Gothic fiction has been around for a very, very long time. It actually um, goes way back into the Georgian period where you have the castle of Otranto. And then, of course, you have that very epic um, few nights away with Byron and Shelley and, and Mary Shelley and um, Polidori, uh, who wrote Vamp the Vampire, which or the Vampire, if you want to pedantic about it which Byron then stole and kind of published it essentially under his own name um 
but the whole kind of gothic craze I think probably started from that and it, it tends to kind of dip and and, and flow and, and it rises in popularity and then disappears off a little bit for a few years but it never completely goes away I think I mean you, you've also got the woman in black you know that, that that's one of the key um you know gothic pieces where you know you have the typical standard it's a, you know that there's a ghost there's very definitely an entity there you have um such novels as turn of the screw as well which has a similar sort of vein but then you also have novels such as stephanie de maurier's rebecca where you have the element of gothic and i think generally gothic for, for me the way i'd interpret it is very much atmosphere um it doesn't necessarily have to be a ghost there. You just have that feeling of um, foreboding, um, the macabre. Um, but there are various different ways to interpret the gothic. You know, you've got Mexican gothic, which is, a, you know, a lot more modern set, obviously, than uh, the Castle of Entranto. Um, it, it's a difficult one because I, th I think the definition of it is so, is so broad in terms of range but I think if we kind of generally connect the obvious tropes so a dark and, and, and dreary place um a mysterious event or kind of past that that is happening a ghost potentially um the darkness of one's heart which could either be and it could be metaphorical it could be physical you know that, that there is the darkness of a personality of, of a person or a physical creature so it, I think it's just very much a grey sort of area that many novels can lean into but it never ever goes away not completely. I didn't ask my question very well what I meant to say was not that oh, there sorry. haven't been gothic <laughs> no it was totally my fault what I meant to say is that critics and reviewers are peppering the word gothic in oh, places sorry. where I don't think they ne it necessarily belongs um, so I'm just, you know, I'm constantly, it's like locked room is being used today in a way that it isn't, isn't what it means. You know, it, it, you know, people are describing the Agatha Christie closed house structure as a locked room mystery, which is, which is not a locked room mystery. So Sarah, what do you think about, uh, about Gothic? I mean, I, to, to your second part of your question just there, I think that uh, critics and publishers and the way that you package books in general, um, or for, for critics who are trying to get clicks on their reviews. I think that a lot of the language that's used, um, in back cover copy or in some of these reviews is to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt. I think Gothic is a bit of a buzzword. Okay. Um, when I hear the word Gothic, just the one word that comes to mind is dark, uh, that can mean, as Susan was saying, atmosphere. That can mean the relationships at the heart of the story, uh, maybe a villainous character. Um, I personally picture like a gorgeous old Gothic mansion with gargoyles and black lace drapery. Uh, but I think to your point, Barbara, sometimes we do see these words, um, you know, I, I know there, there are mysteries that take place on islands and they call it a locked room because it's, you can't leave the island. Uh, so I think you have to sort of read, read the description and the premise of the book as well to figure out if you as a reader are interested in what that book is described as. Well, I think you're right. I think it can lead readers to books that they may not like if, you know, mm -hmm. the buzzword is wrong. I like foreboding. I think there's always that sort of brooding or, you know, um, atmosphere. There doesn't, there doesn't even have to be a murder in Gothic. You know, right. people sure. people somehow or other have decided that, you know, mystery means there's a murder, but that's totally not true. I mean, you know, Dorothy Sayers wrote some great short stories in which there was never a murder. You know, it was like about wine or, right. or other things. Um, you know, it's a very broad umbrella, which is why I call it crime fiction, because, yeah. you know, it it, I think, spreads out. Why don't we call Ian up and see if there are any questions from the audience? He's lurking there. Speak about foreboding. <laughs> there he is. Uh, yes. Uh, one of the viewers just had a comment uh, that they learned about mudlarking from Sarah. Mm. Yeah, mudlarking. So for, for anyone listening who doesn't know what this is, 
It essentially means scrounging around along a body of water in the mud or sand, looking for valuable or historical artifacts. And it's a very popular pastime in central London along the River Thames. I first came across mudlarking uh, probably seven or so years ago. My mother-in-law gifted me a book for Christmas that had different, it, it, mostly images and descriptions of things this one mudlarker had found. And there are several very well-known mudlarkers on Instagram that I started following. And I decided when writing the Lost Apothecary, which is dual timeline. And so our, our present day character, she finds her first clue uh, in the river while mudlarking. And I purposely did that because I a lot of dual timeline historical mysteries begin with kind of looking in grandma's diary or someone going to the attic and, and looking through a box and or maybe an old library. And those are all really beautiful story introductions but I wanted to do something different. And I had had just learned about and started following a lot of mudlarkers online. So I decided she was going to find a vial in the river. And I'm asked often if I've gone mudlarking. The answer is yes. Uh, several years ago, I purchased a permit from the Port of London Authority. And I put on my tennis shoes and plastic gloves and went down to the riverbed on two separate days and went mudlarking. And I think it's a great alternative to going to some of the museums in central London. I mean, I was able to be outside kind of looking through things on my own. I did not find any apothecary vials, but it was a very fun experience. And uh, actually the paperback of my book has a mudlarking 101 guide for anybody who's interested in going themselves. For the both of you, what are some challenges that you face in writing historical fiction? <laughs> uh, I think with historical fiction, you do have the ability to use creative license. Um, but I think for me personally, if the, if the facts are there, if you have the record and it is, it is set in stone, it's for me, it is trying to work around that and being respectful to it and using it in, in some way. And sometimes the story that you want to tell won't, won't necessarily always fit the, the facts that are there. Um, at the back of Pandora, I have an author's note. And on the rare occasions I have you know, diverted away from the original source material, I, I, have, I, have, said, I have said so. Um, but I, th I think with historical fiction, you have that ability to ask why or what or how and fill in the gaps. And even if you are using the original source material, that can be a challenge in itself because you have to then think about how realistic would this be? How can I stay true to the era and the actual, you know, it's essentially the 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 historical kind of limits of the time, especially for women. So Dora herself, as I, as I mentioned earlier to, to Barbara, you know, I needed to give Dora a hobby where she was, it was a realistic one that she, that she could carry out, sketching it, sketching in her bedroom. Now, um, there aren't any obvious records of there being a female jewellery designer who sold designs to the upper classes, but it's not impossible because there is no, you know, there's no kind of specific um, record saying this didn't happen. Um, but at the same time, I needed there to be characters like Edward who could help her along the way, because as I said, she's trapped in her uncle's, uh, her uncle's house. She is a girl with no money, no prospects, no connections. And so she couldn't just stay in this attic room, twiddling her thumbs and hope a miracle would happen. I had to allow her to be guided so that that would help me breach the limitations that were already set in place to her in a society sort of, sort of setting. So it can be tricky to try and get that fine balance and it doesn't always work. So when it doesn't work, that's when you have to kind of note when, you, when it's not worked in the author's note. I think that is very, very important. Yeah, I think Susan sums it up beautifully, um, but I faced a, a similar challenge with 
my 20 something character named Lena in the Lennon Seance Society, she should be working in the family home with the, with the, uh, her family owns a hotel. And, um, instead we find her traveling to Paris by herself, which is, uh, pretty much unheard of in that time frame. but I had to find a way to make it happen. So, um, it's taking that extra time to sort of think under what circumstances might this have been plausible, uh, whether it's, with her father's support, or he accompanies her, or he funds her, or whatever. Um, so there were various societal restrictions that especially women, like Susan said, had to face in these different eras, uh, but you can't necessarily build out your story set in the drawing room of a house. Uh, they've got to get outside and, and make things happen yeah. and, and live their lives in order to have a compelling story. So sometimes you have to just stretch plausibility a little bit and do the best that you can. Um, and certainly some readers will will come through and say, that would have never happened. Or um, why did you write something so uh, anachronistic? And my response to questions like that is I, I had to tell a story. Like, yes, sometimes as a reader, you do have to suspend your belief a little bit. Um, but I think that as long as you take the time to present it to the reader in the best way that you can, and then like Susan said, any, any deviations, you can also justify in your author's note. And then mm -hmm. you sold, you, you aren't held accountable at that point because you've just admitted outright the liberties yeah. that you've taken. Yeah. Excellent. It's point. Historical, I was going to say it's historical fiction. It's fiction at the end yeah. of the day. So we, we, we can, we can have a bit of a play. I'm going to recommend a book that I just read by Diane Biller called House, sorry, Hotel of Secrets, which takes mm -hmm. place in Imperial Vienna in the 19th mm -hmm. century. And she has found a really novel way of giving her female character agency because she's running a hotel. Mm -hmm. The women in her family have run this hotel, which is down on its luck. And so she's trying to work out a way to, um, to bring it back. And it's really fun. It's also slightly implausible, but at the same mm -hmm. time, as you point out, it's fiction. Yeah. So <laughs> right, why not, right. You know, why not enjoy it? Anything yeah. else there, Ian? One final question for the both of you. How do you balance your writing and editing with promoting your novels and your personal life? I think Sarah needs to say this hour. one first. <laughs> Gosh, uh, how do I balance? Well, at the present moment, I'm not. Um, <laughs> it's just chaos. So I... Uh, I just returned home last night uh, from this two week uh, tour I've been doing and I spent a every night for 14 days in a different hotel. Um, that's part of why you see me here in gym clothes and no makeup is because I've kind of reached the point where just whatever I can offer is what I'm giving you. Um, and this <laughs> is what I can offer today. Uh, so how do I balance it? You know, the social media is just kind of, I post on the go when I can, I take pictures of what I'm doing or what I'm reading that seems to work out fine. The writing, I haven't touched my manuscript in almost three weeks. Um, I will open that document up tomorrow and get back at it. So it's not always a, a good balance, but you do the best that you can. Yeah. It's slightly easier for me at the moment because I'm in the middle of writing and structural edits. Um, I specifically asked my um, my publicist to pair back on the events for the paperback release of Pandora here in the UK. Um, but last year when the hardback came out in the UK, it was absolutely manic. And like Sarah, I don't think I managed to look at my manuscript um, for quite a number of weeks. I had to push a couple of deadlines back because I just wasn't finding the time. Um, I had 10 days where I was on the road and just it, with a different hotel every night. And I did the best one in the world. I took my laptop with me to try and attempt something, but it never, ever happened. Mm. It takes a lot out of you. And it's such a pleasure to be able to meet readers and chat to them. And the fact that they that they come and they've bought your book, you want to give them that completely dedicated uh, attention. But at the same time, it does mean that you're absolutely shattered by the time you get back to the hotel. So there was just no way I was going to get any writing done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a partner, um, so I don't have to worry about uh, giving, giving my partner attention. Um, 
I can very much kind of come back and settle in and just get on with things. Um, but I am also a bit of a carer to my mother as well. So I do have to kind of try and balance out as much of the time as possible. It's not always easy, but in this so-called quiet spell at the moment where I don't have any publicity, it is much, much easier to manage. But yeah, it, it's, it's hit and miss and completely depends on the author's schedule. So 33 years ago, when I started The Poison Pen, in a more genteel age, should we say, publishers actually did, publicists did an enormous amount of the work that now authors are expected to do. It, yeah. To have a successful publishing career, my, I talked about to Harlan Coben about this at some length last Monday because he began as the paperback original author and, and became a star to a great degree, not only from his, for his books, but putting himself out there. And, you know, creating a personality that made Lisa Scottolini is very good at that, too. And Hank Philippi Ryan people, you know, and I I think the shift has been pretty dramatic to the author. Um, It's hard not to not to do that. I'm I'm going to end with a final message for you, too, which I think is kind of interesting. The next big thing, believe it or not, which I've just realized since I've done six of these books in the last two and a half months is female rage and female serial killers have suddenly come to the fore. Most interesting are the identical triplet serial killers set here in Arizona. That was an event I did last week. And, you know, we're, you're talking about women finding agency to, you know, that particular line anyway, in some way trying to shape their own lives and take command of them. But all of a sudden, (laughs) all of a sudden it's being taken in contemporary very contemporary crime fiction to a level Mm. that I must say is really surprising. I haven't even figured out how to talk about it. (laughs) I really don't know. Uh, But I'll have to look it up. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, how I'll kill you is is the, you know, the triplets. And yet it it really has some very interesting moral themes since themes are something Mm. that interests you both. Um, And it's not as bizarre in the end, as you might think, but you have to read your way all the way through the book to arrive at at the place where you can make some decisions about whether Mm -hmm. it's believable, whether you sympathize, whatever. But I do think, I do think there's a whole cross genre thing going on too, you know, where you can put things into books. um, They don't have to be rigidly defined. That's one reason I like Gothic. You've already said it's a very inclusive, very, and expansive at the same time, very protein form which I love. So thank you both for spending time. Um, Sarah, I mean, Susan, it, it is a paperback here in the United States. I don't remember that there was, I looked it up, um, but I don't recall there was a hardcover release here. Unfortunately, no, um, but the paperback has been produced lovely, you know, beautifully. So I am very, very happy um, with the fact that it's even overseas with you guys in the first place. Um, but no, it, it is just paperback. Um, over with you in the hardback and paperback is here in the UK. Well, no, I didn't mean just. Um, I, uh, it was. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it it came to my attention sort of by. Um, I'm not even sure how because most of the time um, it's difficult to a lot a lot of time to promoting a paperback for a bookstore uh, because there's not as much, you know, as much money in it. And um, yeah. I I don't know whether it was the cover, whether it was the title, whether Sarah said something, I have no idea. But I'm really delighted that that I did find it and I truly recommend it. Um, it's a Thank wonderful you. book. Yeah. Thank you um, very much. Well, my pleasure. I will look forward to the next one, Darker. Ooh, whales. <laughs> hey. Anyway, thanks very much, ladies. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Try to enjoy some downtime, Sarah, before you have to start it again. Yeah. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Yeah. Thank you Thank all you so much. This was us. great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.